Hey there once again YouTube. It's been a few days, but I'm back once again. Uh, just an update about recent seismicity for a few areas. Mount Rainier saw a quake or two. Very minor quakes. Nothing to Mount St. Helens, but just to the southwest and the southeast we did see a magnitude 1.1 and a little tiny 0.5. Mount Hood keeps seeing some quakes pop off here and there, here and there. A few quakes every other day or so uh, as part of the, probably the aftershocks from that massive, well, not massive, but it was definitely an interesting earthquake swarm. Very, very energetic, rapid-fire earthquake swarm in Mount Hood. I believe that was on the 8th or the 9th. July 8th or July 9th, I forget. Um, but yeah, earthquakes are still popping up there. We do had, uh, we did have an earthquake to the northeast of Salem, near Malala, Oregon. Zooming out, we do have a good amount of quakes at Yellowstone. I'm going to focus on that in just a minute. Let's go to Hawaii real fast. In Hawaii, not too, too much has been happening lately, but we have seen a few minor spasmodic tremor events. And again, if you don't know what spasmodic tremor events are for Hawaii, just come to this page here. Link is in the description box below about what are Hawaii spasmodic tremor events. I show you all the details of what spasmodic tremor looks like in Hawaii, what they're being caused by, and my observations of these events. We have seen a few in the past few days, but they've been pr pretty small. Here we are in the seismic program swarm at station TRAD, which resides on the slopes of Mauna Loa, the southern slopes of, slopes, excuse me, of Mauna Loa. Uh, we do see the most recent spasmodic tremor event started at about 2341 UTC, July 22nd, 2019. It was very short and extremely weak, but you can see we did see another spasmodic tremor event. I believe that is the most recent, the most recent strong one. You have to go all the way back here to this one right here which occurred, it started, I'm going to say, about 1359 UTC on July 19th, 2019. It was definitely pretty strong. The map, maximum amplitude counts going up to about, I'm going to say, 795 for TRAD, which is very strong for this station. Very, very strong. So that definitely was a notable spasmodic tremor event. But nothing really like this for days, guys, ever since the 19th. Not much, and we do see seismicity continues. You can see a lot of earthquakes just by looking through the webby quarter. Look at all those earthquakes, guys. Yeah, so earthquake activity continues from Mauna Loa and Kilauea Summit. Spasmodic tremor continues as well under the Big Island of Hawaii. And uplift continues from Mauna Loa, the Kilauea Summit, and the uh, Kilauea East Rift Zone. Now, I want to move on to California in the Ridgecrest Coastal Volcanic Field area just real quick. Here's the past 24 hours, all magnitudes for the Coastal Volcanic Field and Ridgecrest, California area, which got smacked by a magnitude 6.4 and 7.1 on July 4th and July 5th, 2019, earlier this month. We see earthquake activity is calming down. Swarming, though, swarming does continue within the volcanic field itself, with still a gap of seismicity where the magma chamber is supposedly located. And we do see swarming and aftershocks occurring along this area right here, that fractured during the magnitude 7.1. And let's go to the largest magnitude in the past 24 hours was a magnitude 4.1 all the way down to the southeast at the tip of this area right down here at 5.2 kilometers in depth. Now, I'm going to show some seismic data from WMF, which resides basically right in this location right here, right on top of the volcanic field itself. Let's just take a quick look and see how many earthquakes are still actually occurring. And it has nothing to do with reported earthquakes, guys. This will show earthquakes recorded by the seismic stations themselves without having to deal with any middlemen. You can definitely see seismicity continues quite strong, but the magnitudes are much lower than what they were before. And notice it just continues, guys. No matter where I go with the spectrogram or seismogram plots, you constant earthquakes, guys. Just constant. This right here, I believe, is the 4.1. Let's see here. Let's go back. 4.1 occurred at 7.45 UTC. No, okay, okay, okay. So then we were looking at the 3.9. 7.45 UTC is the 4.1. So right here is the 3.9, which struck, my bad, which struck basically in the middle of this hotbed of seismicity. Still ongoing. It's still not stopping, guys. It is calming down a little bit. Magnitudes are getting smaller and not as many, but there's, so you can tell, it's still popping off almost constantly, guys. The 4.1 was recorded on this station right here, just after 745 UTC, normal high range frequencies. So let's keep going forward, shall we? A lot of earthquakes still, guys. You can tell a lot of them are pretty small. 
and I have not edited the power range of the color at all. It's still maximum 110. Going down. Yeah, the guys, it's still popping off like crazy. Right here, we basically had nothing. And I'm going to do a 1 hertz high pass filter just to get rid of the pesky background micro -seisms. Yeah, oh yeah, it's pretty calm right there, but then we see boom, constant, basically constant. So we still are seeing a lot of seismicity in this area, but there are times where only a few minutes though, I'm only talking about like one or two minutes worth of time where nothing's happening. I mean, there, there's still a lot of earthquakes popping off in this area, guys, and it probably will for quite some time. Now I had someone ask me about GPS deformation in this area. It's about, it's about two weeks after the earthquake, so we should get a good look at where the deformation is headed for this area, see whether uplift or subsidence is occurring in this area, and to see what is going on. So why don't we go take a look at that now? Here we have the Nevada Geodetic Laboratory GPS Network map. Okay, so here we're going to take a look at, notice we have Ridgecrest, California right down here, Searles Valley, and then we have Coso Junction, Coso Volcanic Field is in this area right here. China Lake Weapons Station is right there, right there. Now we're going to take a look at these three GPS stations and see how deformation is transforming in this area. And now looking at the earthquake activity, remember, right here, striking from southeast to northwest, with a gap where the coastal magma chamber is, and then swarming in the north northwestern portion of the coastal volcanic field. That's where the seismicity is ongoing. But the crack that opened up was like right in this area right here. 7.1 struck right in this area right here. Uh, let's go back to the map. So that would be right here, striking from southeast to northwest, right along this location right here. Okay, so we're going to take a look at these three stations. We're going to take a look at this one. And just by looking here, you can see... Now, this is the one right on top of the Coso Magma Chamber, right on top of the supposedly where the magma chamber is located for Coso Volcanic Field, which is about 5% rhyolitic melt. Uh, the rest is about crystal mush or something like that. Because usually magma chambers, they found out, are not just cavities full of magma. They're not. They're crystal mush with little pockets of magma. But it's that mechanism that turns it into eruptible magma that elude scientists still to this day. They still don't understand what is that mechanism, what is that cause to make a magma chamber melt quicker and quicker and quicker. All right, so we see just from just from the coastal volcanic field one right down here. <clears throat> let's go to NA12 clean. Actually, let's go to NA12. Motion of the North American plate is removed with NA12. You can see on the horizontal, the station showed it going towards the west and towards the south. That was during the strike slip event. During strike, and a lot of the earthquakes in this area were strike slip earthquakes, meaning they were horizontal. And I believe they were left lateral strike slip. I believe that's what they found out they were. Meaning that they slipped horizontally. Instead of buckling upwards or buckling downwards, it, it slipped horizontally. Like two blocks sliding against one another. So we basically should only see horizontal deformation from these earthquake events, and we do see that right here. And we'll take a look at some of these other stations. But something I found that was very interesting. Let's go a bit further south. This is a bit south of the volcanic field, but still within the perimeter of it. Right down here again, from southeast to northwest is where that earth, those earthquakes were occurring. 7.1 occurred right about here. Going in the center of this area, I want you to notice something. Now it says, let's go here. And let's go to an A12. Come on, buddy. Okay, so we see there was a little bit of a gap in the data stream right there, but we could see this station supposedly headed towards the northwest, and we did see a little bit of uplift. Now, this uplift could be a mistake. However, I'm saying, however, let's go to the station far to the south at Ridgecrest. C, 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 C. Now, notice... We see the same horizontal deformation patterns on this GPS station from that earthquake, remember? And this one's heading to the west and to the north, so that's to the northwest. But look at this. Is that a spike in uplift? I don't know. Why don't we take a closer look in Microsoft Excel? I'm going to download the raw data, and we're going to take a look at uplift subsidence patterns for all these three stations for COSO and station T. 
T-O-W-G, and also station C-C-C-C. All right, let's take a look at that now in Microsoft Excel. Here we have station COSO. As you can see right here, COSO and A12, which means the motion of the North American plate, the natural motion, will be removed. So we can just see what's going on in this area that has nothing to do with natural plate motion. Okay, so we're going to go right here. Delta U, which would be uplift subsidence, showing trending uplift or trending subsidence. Go all the way down. Highlight this entire section. I'm going to go up to insert. It'll let me. I'm going to press scatter plot. Let's do a scatter plot, just like we see online sometimes. Okay, now this is for about the past year. About the past year, notice we see normal seasonal fluctuations goes down about here, but look at this big dip in subsidence that we see right where the magma chamber is. Now it's not too crazy. Let's see, one, two, three, 330 milliliters, milliliters. <laughs> I mean millimeters, excuse me. So from line to line, from right here to right here would be 10 millimeters, right? Which would be one centimeter. So it's not too crazy, but we do see a good amount of subsidence occurring right on top of where that magma chamber is located. Now, is this seasonal substance or is this substance from magma draining from the magma chamber? Maybe. I don't know for sure because really there shouldn't be a lot of magma in that area. But why don't we go take a look at uplift and substance for the next two stations? So the next station we're going to look at is this one right here, basically right in the center of all this activity, T-O-W-G, and go see, and let's just check out what's going on here, shall we? So here we are in Microsoft Excel with T-O-W-G. Again, the natural motion of the North American plate will be removed, so we'll just see what's going on in this location. Delta U, which would be uplift subsidence. Go down, all the way down. Let's click right about here. There we go. Insert scatter plot right here. Okay. So this station, if you can see over here on the left, this station ended at about early April of this year and then was reactivated on July 5th when that earthquake occurred. Notice that right when that earthquake occurred, there's a big spike in uplift, guys. Look at that. Look at that. But it doesn't, it's a little too early to tell whether it's trending uplift or Okay, personally, this does not make any sense because it's supposed to be a strike-slip fault. Whatever fault, they still, I don't think they've really identified the fault that has done this yet. But it was supposed to be strike-slip, meaning most of the motion should be horizontal. We should not see a huge amount of uplift or really substance at all. So this kind of has me scratching my head why this is like this. I think it's very intriguing. I think they need to pass more satellites over the area with INSAR. I wish we got available INSAR data like we do GPS data, but we don't. I think it's under the control of the USGS and the federal government, sadly. Uh, hopefully someday they put that stuff out there for the public. But you can see when it was, when this station was reactivated on July 5th, there's a big spike in uplift, guys. I'm talking, let's see. One, two, three, 20. Each line, from line to line, is 20 millimeters. So I'm going to say that was a big jump from, that was a big jump of about 6 centimeters, guys. 6 to 7 centimeters. That's a big, big jump in a short, even in April. Even in April, guys, because this station's data ended in April, early April of this year. And then just a few months later, we see multiple centimeters, almost 7 centimeters of uplift detected on this station. And of course, horizontal deformation was detected as well, of course, as we should see here. Let me show you something real quick. We're on this same station. Let's look at the north-south plot. Delta N. Let's go all the way down. We're going to see the horizontal deformation that occurred because of this earthquake. Because it's a strike-slip earthquake, so we should see some very strong horizontal deformation. See, we see the same thing right there. But I'm very confused as to why uplift would be shown so strong on this station, which resides, let me go back, right in the center right here so yeah very interesting now let's take a look at just south of ridgecrest i wish we had another one right here i really wish we did but we don't let's use this station near ridgecrest quadruple c as i like to call it right there here we have station quadruple c now this one is pretty far away it's even south of ridgecrest so we might not get a very good look at what's going on I really think they should put some more GPS stations in that area just in case because they really do not have a lot of GPS stations to go on 
to detect if there is significant uplift going on. But we're going to use this again. This is just south of Ridgecrest. And take a look at uplift subsidence for this station. And yes, we do. We do see uplift. Yes, we do. Oh, man. That's very interesting. Okay. So, let's see. Did this station end at all? No, it didn't. It's been continuous. It never was cut off. The data stream was never ended. And we see, right around when those earthquakes happen, we do see ongoing uplift for the Ridgecrest area. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, so each line from line to line is 10 millimeters, which would be one centimeter. So uplift near the Ridgecrest area is not too great, but this looks like it is trending upwards. It does. And it does not look like it's stopping. But it's a little bit too early to tell where this is going. But yes, there is uplift near the Ridgecrest area and the China, China Lake Weapon Station area. Yes, there is. So we definitely should keep a very close eye on this. Very interesting that the seismicity would be calming down, though, because it does seem like seismicity is slowly, very slowly calming. But then uplift is still occurring in the Ridgecrest area. So definitely keep an eye on it. I'm not saying a volcanic eruption is coming, but we got to look at the data with no bias, guys. Here we are at Yellowstone. Over the past week or so, there have been two very minor swarms near the Lower Geyser Basin, with today being a good-sized moderate, a nice moderate earthquake swarm near the Lower Geyser Basin. Zooming in, you'll see where the Lower Geyser Basin is. There's the Lower Geyser Basin. Upper Geyser Basin is right down here. It's just to the east-northeast, right in this location right here. Now going to isthisthingon.org, which is a pretty good tool just for simple, quick overview. Never use Webby Quarters for analysis, guys. Never, ever, ever. You should always use seismic uh, seismograms, seismic spectrograms, and seismic spectra plots. Just saying, they are seismic because a lot of people think that spectrograms show gas, but I don't want to get into that again because I've gotten into that probably a million times, and if people aren't going to listen, people aren't going to listen. Who cares? Uh, but down here we see many, 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 many earthquakes showing up all over the park like they should. Remember, seismic waves propagate away from their source like a ripple in a pond. If you see it only show on one station, it is 99% chance it's not seismic. Even some of the smaller earthquakes show up on a lot of these stations. You notice that? Let's look all the way down to MCID. This is far away. We do see the two earthquakes right there, which were uh, 2.1, 2.9. But still, that is what we should see. Always propagate away from the source like a ripple in a pond. You cannot see the closest seismic station on here. YML on is this thing on .org seems to be the closest seismic station, but it is not. Look at this. Okay, so we had a 2.9 and 7.9 kilometers in depth. All around the same um, same depth, about 8.5 kilometers to about 4 kilometers in depth or so. And, and then we saw 1.4, 2.9, or excuse me, 2.1, 1.0, 0.8, 0.1. 1 1.3, 0 0.7, 1.1, 1.1, 2.4, 1.4. One None of these were reportedly felt. See, a lot of the earthquakes in Yellowstone are not reportedly felt because there really are not a lot of people around to feel them, really, guys. Especially if it's in the middle of the night or in the middle of the morning. There won't be that many people around to feel them. But if this was a highly populated area, they definitely would. Now, I want to show you. Let's use, let's just use a random earthquake real quick you'll see what the closest seismic station is to these events. Go to origin, phases, arrival time, borehole 207. But you do not see that on is this thing on .org because you got to be able to find the data, guys. If you ever need help finding data, I'm the man. I can find data even from uh, very hard networks to get it from. Even like the Italian, even foreign databases I can access data from. And those can be really hard to access data from sometimes. So if you ever need help accessing data, just let me know. Let's type in PB Oral 207 on the station search map, which is the Iris G map. Link under resources in the description box below. Notice where Borehole 207 resides. Notice right down here. Oh, sorry guys. Zoom out a little bit. Right here. Okay. Man, my computer's going slow. Notice we have West Thumb Lake right there. Up, upper Geyser Basin's right here. Lower Geyser Basin's right about here. And notice we see West Yellowstone over here. Madison Campground right here. So obviously, since the earthquakes are occurring basically in this area right here, we do see Borehole 207 is the 
station to get it from. I don't know why the data center says NCEDC. That's ridiculous because you get it from the Iris network. I don't know. I think that's a glitch. Yeah, that's definitely... I'd rather go through the Iris DMC for that. But let's take a look at the swarm in the size of a program. Swarm from Borehole 207. Here we have the past four days of seismic data for Borehole 207 in the PB network. And at, as of 12.30 p.m. Pacific Time, July 23rd, 2019, this was on July 19th, 2019, we did see a somewhat rapid-fire swarm in the same area near the Lower Geyser Basin. Let's move forward. A few quakes here and there, calmed down for about two days. Then we saw another burst in seismicity right here on the 20, late in the 22nd day. Actually... That's early in the morning for Mountain Time. Early in the morning for Mountain Time on the 22nd. And then today, whoops, my bad. And then today, boom, we see the larger swarm appeared. Magnitude's only reaching about 3.0 or so. And we do see right here is the magnitude 3.0, magnitude 2.9, right there. Many, many earthquakes. Not seeing any significant low frequency background tremor correlating on surrounding stations, which is a good sign. Always look out for low-frequency volcanic tremor, guys. No matter where you're looking, always look for it. Still seeing a lot of quakes popping off. I will make an analysis page for this earthquake swarm tonight or tomorrow morning, but I will get that out soon. Notice we see another earthquake right here. We see another larger earthquake. Very strong S-wave arrivals. Very, very strong. Those P wave starts right about here. S wave starts right about there. Every earthquake has P and S wave arrivals. That's how they locate earthquakes. If they don't have P and S wave arrivals, you can't locate it. Because that's how you locate them. More earthquakes. More earthquakes. Something very intriguing right here. Whoa. That's very weird. Only going to 30 amplitude count though, so that's very weak. But I will include that in the analysis post. Very interesting. Keep going forward. Calm down for a little bit. Then we saw, let's see, those aren't quakes. Right here, we got some more quakes. Very, very tiny, tiny, tiny quakes after the main burst in seismicity. And as of the past hour, we did see some more earthquakes in this area. Looks like actually two occurring at once right there. And as of the past half hour, as of 12.30 p.m. Pacific time, we do see more quakes are still popping off near the lower geyser basin at Yellowstone. But... The most recent ones in the past few hours have been much smaller than the main burst in seismicity. So it is possible this is leading towards a larger earthquake, a larger earthquake swarm, or it's just dying off. Keep an eye out for my analysis page tonight. I will do a post about that when it comes out. So you guys just keep an eye on my YouTube channel or my Facebook page. And I'm pretty sure that's it. Let's go to earthquake.usgs.gov just to make sure that I did not miss anything. Make sure nothing happened while I was recording, because sometimes it does. Nope, nothing really changed. World. Looks like we had an earthquake. Supposedly. Look at this. A magnitude 2.5, supposedly at negative 3.5 kilometers in depth. That would be 3.5 kilometers above sea level. I think that is wrong. I do not believe they constrained the depth on that correctly, because... That would be in the air, and obviously we know earthquakes cannot occur in the air at all, and if it was any type of major explosion to cause a 2.5, anyone in the area would have reported reported seeing it, or at least feeling it. So, we did see another earthquake at Mauna Loa, uplift continues for those three volcanoes, Mauna Loa Summit, Kilauea Summit, and the Kilauea East Rift Zone, uplift continues. Hope you guys have a great day, keep an eye on the uplift going on near Ridgecrest Coastal Volcanic Field area. Seems to be more prevalent near the southern edge of the coastal volcanic field and in the Ridgecrest area. But earthquake activity seems to be calming down a little bit. So I really don't know what the heck is going on, guys. Makes no sense. Really, there should not have been any substantial uplift at all associated with these events, especially... I mean, there could have been a little bit here and there. But with those stuff that we're seeing, there shouldn't have been that much, guys. Because a lot of these events were strike-slip events, meaning most of the energy was horizontal. Not upwards, not downwards, but horizontal. Strike-slip is a horizontal, where two blocks slide past one another. I don't know. You be the judge. I showed the data. God bless. Hope you guys have a great day. See you later.